Welcome back to Life and Living. You know, just a couple of minutes can be the difference between life or death. But how do you know when you should call an ambulance? Well, with me now to help us understand all of this is Jamie Chebra, Director of EMS at JFK, and Mark Bober, Assistant Director of EMS at JFK. Welcome to both of you. Thank you. Ambulatory services, EMS, not buzzwords really in our households, right? It's not something we're talking about, but when something happens, a heart attack, some kind of major accident, all of a sudden it matters. Jamie, I'm gonna start with you. Okay. Why should people be calling an ambulance? Why should people be calling 911 and getting that care instead of taking themselves to a hospital, to a doctor? So there's a lot of reasons why you should, you know, trust the emergency medical services system to provide you rapid and efficient care in times of your particular emergency need, whether it be an accident or a heart attack. First responders, EMTs, paramedics are very well trained in doing exactly what the emergency department would do before you even get to the emergency department. Basically, we're bringing the emergency department to you. And if you think about it in that respect, you have the advantage of staying right where you are and allowing us to bring all that care to you in that setting. What's wrong with the thinking that, okay, let me just get myself there quickly. I know I can drive fast. You know, I don't know how long it's going to take the ambulance to get to me, so let me just do this on my own. Or, conversely, I don't think it's that bad. I'm just going to take care of it myself because I don't, I don't want to be dramatic and call an ambulance. It couldn't be that bad. So not that bad is definitely the famous last words that most people regret in the end. Um, I think that... Not that bad is definitely something that if you're toying with the idea of getting checked out, especially in an emergency setting, you probably should. As far as driving yourself to the emergency department, uh, we definitely worry about the state people are in, and I understand that a lot of people are saying, yes, I can make it, no problem, but they don't necessarily consider what happens if you don't make it and if you slump over at the wheel or something along those lines. That leads to other people getting hurt as well, and I don't think that's something that anybody ever sets out to do on their way. As far as bringing yourself there or having somebody bring you there, if the ambulance comes to you, it's like initiating the healthcare system immediately. So we don't just think of ourselves as ambulance drivers who bring you to the hospital. We think of ourselves as step one in the healthcare continuum. So in a case like a stroke or in a case like a heart attack, the time that we spend in the field actually equates to time saved when you get to the door. We do the same interventions and we prep you properly so that you get to the places in the hospital where the definitive care actually occurs. And Mark, what do we actually know about outcomes when someone does call the ambulance, especially in a situation like a heart attack or stroke? So for a heart attack and stroke specifically, there are specific guidelines put out there by the American Heart Association. Uh, and if you're an EMS organization that has achieved a Mission Lifeline Gold Award, that means that your times for patients achieving door-to-balloon success are much shorter than the national average. Balloon meaning a stent put in the heart to open a passageway, right? Right. So that would be what the fixes for, for a heart attack. And, and the faster that we can get people onto the cath lab table and the faster that we can have that happen for a person, generally speaking, the better their outcomes are. So that time saved really does equate to the potential for somebody to be able to climb a flight of stairs for the rest of their life. What about in a situation like sepsis? So in sepsis specifically, we've actually done a lot of work to try and make sure that patients brought into the hospital are recognized for the state that they're in and treated appropriately. And explain quickly what sepsis is. So sepsis is an infection, a systemic infection of your body, uh, usually a blood infection. And when a patient is septic, they usually have a fever. They usually um, have a number of things wrong with them that need to be treated with an antibiotic and need to be treated with rapid fluid administration. Sepsis is one of the uh, major topics that has kind of been overlooked over the past years in the wake of things like stroke and heart attack getting a lot of the press. Uh, but it's just as deadly. It, it's just as important an emergency. So EMS has kind of been charged with the idea of identifying uh, early treatment and early recognition of these patients and making sure that the hospital knows what's wrong with these patients on the way in the door. And that equates to time saved and that equates to shorter hospital length of stay. How much time saved? Preliminary data we've been able to collect over the past 18 months, uh, we believe it to be about a day and a half. So a day and a half saved in the hospital simply because you called the ambulance, because you called the paramedics, the EMS, the EMTs. Jamie, I want to ask you this. In terms of response times, right? Mm -hmm. Quick personal story. I was at an apple orchard, and a man had a major uh, heart issue. And we watched, and it took at least upwards of 20 minutes for the ambulance to get there. And I'm sitting there thinking, wow, this, this is a long time. Right. What do we know about the importance of response times, and how is JFK in particular addressing that? So interestingly enough, response times on the EMS side are still something that need to be proven f to be effective. Obviously, a time like 20 minutes is a significant impact. But when you start splitting down to minutes and seconds, it's really questionable as to what kind of long-term impact that has on patient care. It's more about the quality of care you render when you're there. 
And if you look at the system in New Jersey, the way it's designed, the basic life support services in the, in the, across the state really save lives. They're the ones with CPR and Narcan and epinephrine that really make the acute time-sensitive changes in somebody's condition that you know, preserve life. Um, the paramedics are more of the, the rolling emergency department who will provide that level of care that decreases morbidity and mortality. So how are you anticipating where you need to be, where you need to have ambulances stationed? How is that all happening? So one of the things that we do is we retrospectively look at information as far as call type, call time, call location. And we do this, we gather data, I guess we have about five years worth of data in our service area. And we use that in a way to predict temporally and geographically where the next call is going to be. And we've done so with some significant success. What is that based on? Um, so basically, it honestly comes down to human behaviors, human patterns of behavior. You know, there are times when people are asleep, there are times when people are eating, there are times when people are, you know, moving throughout their day. So we know when traffic is going to be heavier. Or so weather, um, traffic, um, the time of year, is it a holiday, all those things kind of factor into what we anticipate, where we anticipate, when we anticipate the call going to be. The so call, the, the likeliness of be. an accident. Correct. It's really it's statistics and probability right. is what it comes down to. And um, I going to refer you to Mark, who was an absolute non-believer in this when we first started. It's true. He's no. a convert. He is a convert. Come on, don't be the pessimist in the group, Mark. <laughs> I said, where's the crystal ball? There's no way that we could possibly predict where the next person's going to call 911. But and you then, stand corrected? And better than 90% of the time, we are right around the corner from the emergency. So there's this REM score. Explain what it means. The rapid emergency medical score in just the minute that we have left. So for us, it's not just about getting there quickly. It's also about proving that the time that we spend with the patient makes a difference in the patient's long-term outcome. So REMS is basically designed to say, yes, we absolutely have great response times, but do we make a difference in the healthcare continuum? Do we make a difference in the patient's length of stay, morbidity, mortality? And so is this simply based on the success of the treatment for the patient? It's based not only on the time that we're with the patient, whether they get better, but also as they move from the emergency department to in-house. Um, how their trajectory is, how their prognosis is from there, from the time that we're able to spend with them. And what about for those who have a strain or, or a sprain or something like that, even a broken bone, do you recommend the ambulance then? So it's always difficult to say we don't recommend calling 911, but I think that as we move into the future of healthcare and the future of EMS, what you'll find is when 911 is called for a reason that may not necessarily need to be seen in an emergency department, we can start moving to bringing patients to clinics. It's about the right care at the right time, the right price, and you know to decrease that strain or sprain. You know some of those injuries, while they seem benign, can be fairly de debilitating if they're not attended to quickly. But without the attention of a medical professional to make that determination, it becomes very difficult. Right. So leave it to the medical professionals to determine the severity of the case, how it should be handled, and as you said, as we move into more cost-effective models, we'll right. be able to better treat the patient without incurring additional costs. Correct. Right. Fair to say? Yes. Jamie Chebra, Mark Bober from the EMS at JFK. I can't thank you both enough. Thank you. Thank you. Great advice. Call that ambulance. Call the medical professionals. They will tell you what to do. Life and Living has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 25 years of broadcast excellence. Funding for this edition of Life and Living with Joanna Gagas has been provided by Johnson & Johnson, PSE&G, Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, New Jersey Sharing Network, New Jersey State Nurses Association, and the Institute for Nursing, the Northward Center, and by NJM Insurance Group. Additional support provided by Melandre Salon and Sulis Spa. Look beautiful, feel beautiful. Life and Living with Joanna Gagas has been produced in partnership with TriStar Studios.